This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Miss Wayne. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Ms. Wayne, as this is your first appointment with me, I'd like to ask you a few questions and get to know a little bit about your medical history. It's also a chance for you to ask me any questions you might have. Sure. I understand from your GP that you have arthritis. That's right, yes. It's in my hands and wrists mainly. The finger joints in my hands get really puffed up when they're swollen, like they are now. The pain can get so bad that it stops me doing a lot of very simple things. Things like having a shower or getting dressed. Then there's the trouble I have making breakfast. Anything where I have to grip and move my wrist, like holding the kettle and pouring, or buttering some toast. Well, you get the idea. It's not like I'm an old woman. I'm only 40. Mm, I see. Uh, tell me about your work. I used to be a hairdresser, but I had to give it up after my hands started getting really bad. I couldn't just sit around the house and do nothing, though. So now I go to the local primary school where my kids are and help the children with their reading. And just lately, I've started helping out on the telephone helpline for people with disabilities. They have these special hands-free phones, so it means I can do the work without needing to use my hands so much. It's only a volunteer position, but I really feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. Is your mobility affected at all by the arthritis? I do have trouble getting in and out of bed or out of a bath. I also need help getting out of a chair if it's a bit low. I move around the house with the walking aid I have, and when I go out, I tend to use a wheelchair. Our car has also been modified, so at least I'm independent. I can go to the shops or out with friends. I'm guessing you've had uh, physiotherapy treatment before. Yes. In the past, it's mainly consisted of heat treatment, but now I'm really interested in some sort of gentle exercises, if that's at all possible. I also really want to make sure that my hand splints are still helping, and not making the condition worse. Sure, I can look at that for you. I've also been to an occupational therapist before. I needed help when things started getting really difficult around the house. I found her very helpful. She had lots of gadgets to help me do things like dressing and cooking, and so many good ideas about how to help with my tiredness without making the pain worse. Okay, we can talk more about some of the techniques you use to help you at our next appointment. Uh, what about your medication? I take analgesics for the pain mainly these days. I used to take those, you know, those anti-inflammatory drugs, but the benefits seemed to wear off and they started making me feel sick, so I had to stop taking them. I do sometimes get a steroid injection, but not very often. It works really well at reducing the pain for a few weeks, but it hurts like hell. Dr. Wong has mentioned a steroid tablet I could take, which will work in a similar way, so we might be looking into that soon. 
and uh, a couple of times a day I have an analgesic cream that I rub into my hands. I don't know if it really works very well though. A doctor talking to Mr. Roy Daphnis about his planned hospital admission. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mr. Daphnis, this appointment is a chance for us to talk a little about your upcoming surgery and for you to ask me any questions you might have. Okay, yes. Well, I don't really have any questions about the surgery itself. I feel I understand the procedure quite well from all of my reading, but I do have a concern. I'm actually quite worried about how I'll go with my eczema when I come into hospital. It's important for me to follow my usual routine, you see, or it will flare up again. What is it specifically that you're worried about? Well, I've had eczema for years now, since I was a kid. It's chronic, I guess you could say, and there are all sorts of things that make it worse. Like getting too hot, you know? Like I'm in a room and the sun is shining in through the window and it starts getting very stuffy or something. Okay, we can make sure that you have a bed well away from any windows if that'll help. Yes, that would be good. Thank you. As long as I'm in an air-conditioned room and it isn't too hot, that usually helps. I also notice that certain foods and drinks make it worse. I stopped drinking alcohol years ago because it always made the itching worse. But I also have a list of foods that seem to aggravate things. So I was wondering if it's possible to give that to someone or if I can let the hospital know so that they don't include any of these foods in my meals. If you contact the hospital directly, they'll be able to help you with that. Great. Tell me, Mr. Daphnis, what's your skin like at the moment? Oh, uh, not very good. You can see by my face how red it is, and the itching and scratching has been much worse lately. I think because of the stress I'm feeling about the operation. It's also really bad on my back and my legs. When I lie down in bed at night sometimes, I can hardly stand it. Do you ever get any sores or weeping? No, my skin is just dry and very itchy but I'm most worried that because of the operation, any broken areas in the skin will mean I'm at risk of an infection. I'm doing everything I can to prepare properly though. Instead of showers, I've been taking lukewarm baths and I never use any soap because it leaves my skin extra dry. 
I know using it removes the natural oil, so I use a soap substitute instead. I'm being really careful about the clothes I wear to be sure that they aren't going to exasperate the itching. I really don't want to be scratching it at all if I can help it, and I've been using an oily moisturiser nearly every hour. I don't like to use a lot of those steroid creams and things, but I can if you think it'll help. I see a dermatologist sometimes and he said if I don't like using them, I can save them as a last resort. Okay, it sounds like you're doing everything you can to manage the condition, but you do need to try and relax and make sure you're getting plenty of rest. I know that stress is only going to make the condition worse. You're right. I know I'm probably getting worked up over nothing and everything will be fine. I'm taking an antihistamine at the moment, so that's helped with the scratching and I'm sleeping a, a bit better as well. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear a discussion about different types of different types of kidney cancers. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you brief me about different types of kidney cancers? Well, like any other cancer, kidney cancer starts when the normal cells in one or both kidneys mutate and grow aggressively, forming a tumor or mass which can be benign or malignant. Kidney cancers that have originated elsewhere and metastasized to the kidney are clear cell adenocarcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma from the bladder, renal lymphoma, inverted papilloma carcinosarcoma, teratoma, and carcinoid tumor of the renal pelvis. Renal cell carcinoma is the most common type of kidney cancer that accounts for 80 to 85% of all cases. This develops within the microscopic filtering systems of the kidney, which are the tiny tubes that carry the urine to formation. Transitional cell carcinoma, also known as urothelial carcinoma, usually begins in the area where urine collects before moving to the bladder. Pathologically, this cancer is similar to bladder cancer and is treated like bladder cancer. Kidney sarcoma is a rare form of kidney cancer that is usually treated with surgery and chemotherapy. Sarcomas may be large and usually does not spread. Wilms tumor is a common type of kidney cancer that occurs among children and is treated differently than kidney cancers in adults. Common treatments for Wilms tumors are radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Squamous cell carcinoma, juxtoglomerular cell tumor, or Raynanoma, Bellini duct carcinoma, mesoblastic nephroma, mixed epithelial stromal tumors, or other types of kidney cancers. Question 26. 
You hear the discussion between two doctors about types of perforations during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Now, read the question. Doctor, can you explain the types of perforations during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography? Well, although perforation is an unusual complication of endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, the diseases of the duodenum and common bile duct can increase the risk of perforation during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. There are four types of perforations during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography based on etiology and site of perforation. Type 1 is perforation of the lateral or medial duodenal wall caused due to excessive pressure from the endoscope or its acute angulation. Type 2 perforation is periampullary injury, often associated with sphincterotomy or difficulty accessing the biliary tree. Type 3 perforation is injury to the common bile duct or pancreatic duct caused by instrumentation. Type 4 perforation is the presence of retroperitoneal free air with no evidence of actual perforation. This is usually an incidental finding and is of little or no clinical consequence. Question 27. You hear a discussion between two doctors about clinical manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the clinical manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Well, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with two major clinical manifestations. Emphysema, resulting from the loss of the proteolytic protection of the lung by alpha-1 antitrypsin, a toxic loss of function. Other clinical manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency include panniculitis and an association with cytoplasmic antineutrophil, Cytoplasmic antibody positive vasculitis. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about autoimmune liver disease. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the autoimmune liver disease? Well, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, and primary sclerosing cholangitis are the three most common forms of autoimmune liver disease. Autoimmune hepatitis is characterized by high levels of serum alanine aminotransferase and aspartate aminotransferase, whereas primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis are associated with predominant elevations of alkaline phosphatase since they are cholestatic disorders. Primary biliary cirrhosis and autoimmune hepatitis are associated with autoantibodies in the serum, such as antinuclear antibody, smooth muscle antibody, and antimitochondrial antibody. Primary sclerosing cholangitis usually affects the extrahepatic biliary system. Thus, if it is present, abnormalities can be seen on imaging. Question 29. You hear a discussion about brain chemicals involved in mood regulation. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. 
What are the brain chemicals involved in mood regulation? Well, basically there are three molecules, chemically known as monoamines, that are involved in mood regulation. Serotonin has been coined the brain's feel-good chemical. Norepinephrine is another neurotransmitter connected with depression and how alert the feelings are. A low level of norepinephrine is considered to be associated with the brain fog that many people with depression experience. Whereas low levels of dopamine in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra associated with Parkinson's disease. But there is much more to dopamine. In the frontal lobes of the brain, it is associated with complex thinking and problem solving. In fact, it is considered that the stimulatory effects of chemicals such as nicotine and cocaine are related to their effects on the dopamine-mediated reward centers in the brain. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of gastric juices. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of gastric juices? Well, the food we swallow mixes with gastric juices secreted by special glands in the lining of the stomach. They include the cardiac glands at the top part of the stomach, the oxyntic glands in the main part of the stomach, and the pyloric glands in the antrum or lowest part of the stomach. Therefore, each of the glands contains cells that produce specific components that are called the gastric juices. Next cells produce bicarbonate and mucus. Parietal cells generate hydrochloric acid. Chief cells produce pepsinogen. And enteroendocrine cells generate various hormones. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid secreted by the parietal cells, and it lowers the pH level of the stomach to around 2. Hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen into pepsin and breaks various nutrients apart from the food we eat. It also destroys bacteria that comes along with the food. Gastric lipase is another digestive enzyme made by the chief cells. It helps break down short and medium chain fats. Amylase is also found in gastric juices, but it isn't made by the stomach. This enzyme comes from saliva and travels along the bolus into the stomach. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates, but doesn't have much time to work on the stomach because the acidity stops it. Intrinsic factor is secreted by the parietal cells and is necessary to absorb vitamin B12. This is essential for healthy nervous system function and blood cell production. Finally, the gastric juices contain water and mucus. The mucus is secreted by the neck cells and helps coat and protect the stomach lining from the acid environment. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, 
choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors on differential blood test. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, doctor. What is a differential blood test? Well, a differential blood test enables the physician to determine how many white blood cells are in the body. There are five types of white blood cells, and the test also shows how many of each type of white blood cells are present. The results provide details about the condition of a patient's immune system and its response to diseases. Who requires a differential blood test, doctor? A differential blood test helps diagnose a range of acute or chronic conditions. And often, this is ordered when trying to confirm a diagnosis, such as for any signs of acute illness, such as the flu or urinary tract infection. Or else, they may be looking for a chronic condition, such as an autoimmune disorder, or one that affects the bone marrow. The bone marrow is responsible for producing white blood cells, so changes in white blood cell counts can indicate the functioning of bone marrow. A differential blood test may be ordered if a patient has symptoms, such as body aches, chills, fever, a headache, pain, or particularly in the bones. Although a differential blood test can indicate problems with the white blood cells, it will not be the only test that is used to make a complete diagnosis. The five types of white blood cells are Neutrophils are the most common type of white blood cells, which are responsible for destroying bacteria in injured or infected tissue. Monocytes also destroy bacteria, causing chronic infections and a role in repairing damaged tissues. Eosinophils are responsible for treating infections caused by parasites, and they also control the immune system response to allergic reactions. Basophils are the least common type of white blood cell, and their function is yet to be defined. However, they may play a role in allergic reactions. There are three types of lymphocytes. B lymphocytes generate antibodies to attack specific viruses, bacteria, and other foreign invaders. T lymphocytes help to identify cells that require an immune response. The third type, called a natural killer cells, destroy cancer cells and viruses. Therefore, each type of white blood cell plays an essential role in the immune system. When a differential blood test result is received, it should also contain a reference range of normal values from the laboratory to evaluate if the white blood cell levels are low, normal, or high. Overall, an increased level of white blood cell count than normal level may indicate the presence of an infection. Typically, normal values for neutrophils are between 2,500 and 6,000 cells. A person with a very low neutrophil count will have fewer than 1,000 cells, a condition called neutropenia. While the results of a differential blood test will give details about all five types of white blood cells, a doctor will usually focus on just one or two types. Depending on the type of cell, high or low levels can indicate different issues, such as a high level of basophil count can indicate certain types of leukemia, including chronic myeloid leukemia. 
It can also be an indication of severe allergic reactions. Patients with inflammatory disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis, may also have high basophil counts. Typically, a low basophil count does not indicate a medical condition. However, allergic reactions, stress, steroid use, and hyperthyroidism can result in a basophil count. A high eosinophil count is caused due to an allergic reaction such as asthma, eczema, or a reaction to a medication. Inflammatory disorders such as celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease can also cause high eosinophil count. Usually, eosinophils are present in such a low quantity that low readings do not tend to indicate any health condition. However, stress or steroid use can also cause a low eosinophil count. A high lymphocyte count can indicate an acute viral infection, such as chickenpox, herpes, or hepatitis. Or else, a lymphocyte count may be high due to a bacterial infection, such as tuberculosis or pertussis, or a condition such as lymphocytic leukemia or lymphoma. A low lymphocyte level can indicate an autoimmune disorder such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. The presence of tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis, or the flu can also cause a lymphocyte count to be low. A high monocyte count is caused due to chronic infections such as tuberculosis or a fungal infection. The presence of a condition such as endocarditis, inflammatory bowel disease, monocytic leukemia, juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia, scleroderma, or rheumatoid arthritis can also cause a count to be high. Most physicians do not consider a single low monocyte count as significant. However, low monocyte results on several tests can indicate hairy cell leukemia or bone marrow damage. A high level of neutrophil count can be an indication of an acute bacterial infection, inflammation, tissue death, stress on the body, or chronic leukemia. The neutrophil count may also become high when the person is in the last trimester of pregnancy. A neutrophil count may be low after an adverse drug reaction or chemotherapy treatments, illnesses such as myelodysplastic syndrome, autoimmune disorders, bone marrow cancers, and aplastic anemia can also cause low neutrophil counts. A differential blood test is one of the different lab tests that is used to confirm a diagnosis of an infection or illness. Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on different types of hernias. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Could you please explain to us about different types of hernias? Well, inguinal hernias are located in the lower abdomen just above the leg crease, adjacent or near the pubic region. At times, they can also occur on both sides of the pubic area, which is called bilateral inguinal hernias. 
Inguinal hernias, along with femoral hernias, make up the two types of groin hernias and can cause pain that extends into the upper thigh or scrotum. Inguinal hernias can be categorized as direct or indirect. An indirect inguinal hernia occurs due to natural weakness in the internal inguinal ring, while a direct inguinal hernia caused due to the weakness in the floor of the inguinal canal and is more likely to develop in men above 40. The floor of the inguinal canal is located just below the internal inguinal ring. When inguinal hernias are repaired using the tension repair technique, recurrence rates may be more than 15%. However, other techniques used for hernia repair, such as tension-free and laparoscopic tension-free, have much lower recurrence rates of just 1%. A sportsman's hernia is a condition of chronic exercise-related supra-inguinal groin pain. Generally, it involves a direct inguinal hernia. Femoral hernias, along with inguinal hernias, are groin hernias, which are very common in women but can occur in men as well. A weakness in the lower groin makes the intestinal sac to drop into the femoral canal, a space near the femoral vein that carries blood from the leg. These hernias are highly prone to develop incarceration or strangulation as an early complication. Incisional hernias appears in the abdomen at the site of a previous surgery that can appear weeks, months, or even years after a surgery and can vary in size from small to very large and complex. Umbilical hernias appear near the belly button or navel due to a common weakness from the blood vessels of the umbilical cord. This may occur in infants at or just after birth and may resolve by three or four years of age. However, in adults, umbilical hernias will not resolve and may progressively worsen over time. Epigastric hernias are more common in men than women. They occur due to a weakness or opening in the muscles or tendons of the upper abdominal wall on a line between the breastbone and the navel or umbilicus. Spigalian hernias, a protrusion of intestine or an empty sac through a weakness between the muscle fibers of the abdominal wall, often on the right-hand side of the abdomen. It becomes impossible to detect because often there is no obvious swelling or lump. It develops between the muscles of the abdominal wall rather than protruding through layers of fat. It often develops in later life of men and women when the abdominal muscles become weaker. Hadal hernias are slightly different from other types of hernias because they are a weakness or opening in the diaphragm that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. These hernias cause reflux of acid from the stomach into the esophagus, resulting in heartburn, pain, and erosion of the esophagus. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.